thrilled and delighted to be hosting Paul Johnson, who will be speaking about a book that uh, if you haven't yet read it, you can get your hands on it on the way out. Um, and um, we have developed a bit of a specialty here at the SPP of helping launch books. Um, and we're very, very happy to be uh, hosting Paul, who will be discussing Follow the Money, How Much Does Britain Cost? I have some instructions that I have to uh, make sure I um, share with you before we get going. Uh, this is a hybrid event, so we have a live audience and we also have an online audience. We will try to uh, seek questions from both when we get to the Q&A uh, bit of it. If you're tweeting, and I hope some of you are, the, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE UK economy. Uh, this event is being recorded and it may be turned into a podcast. So um, I hope that is okay with everyone, uh, both here and in the online audience. The format is going to be very simple. We will not have a very formal presentation, but rather we will have more of a conversation. I will sort of get going in a minute by asking Paul to tell us a, a bit about the themes of the book. And then I will ask a few questions, and then, of course, we will open it up to a Q&A with you, the audience. Let me just say a bit more about our guest tonight. Paul Johnson has been director of the IFS since January 2011. He is currently also a visiting professor in the Department of Economics at UCL up the street. He has published extensively. I'm not going to read his publications, so we would be here for quite a while. Um, and of course, he has uh, performed public service and services to economics and to public policy debates in this country. I will add that I was um, in Brazil last week and I was asked what kinds of things had I come across in the UK that I thought Brazil should imitate. And without much hesitation, I said, you should have an institute for fiscal studies like the one in the UK, which performs an absolutely crucial function. Um, and um, I said that because I happen to believe it. Um, so congratulations. Well, I hope they the, invite me over uh, soon. Absolutely. Um, well, if you think you're dealing with big fiscal problems there, um, you may be coming across much larger um, problems there uh, in a country which just reached 100% of GDP and public debt, of course, that's about, you know, smaller than what you, the UK has. But of course, real interest rates are three times there what they are here. So the carrying cost of that debt is a bit of an issue. But in any case, we're not here to talk about Brazil. We're here to talk about the United Kingdom and follow the money. So Paul, just to get us started, um, uh, we will not ask you to give us a 20 minute uh, presentation in the book, but tell us a bit about the major themes. And I'm also curious about what motivated you to write a book or a generalist audience. You know, I run a school of public policy and we think a lot about the importance, but also the difficulties of writing in a serious way about economics and economic policy for non-specialists in plain English. And I have to say the book is very, very readable and fun to read. So what were you hoping to accomplish and, 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 and how did you go about it? Yeah, well, part, part of that question is easier than the other. I mean, what, why, why, why did I think it was important to write something for a generalist audience? Because I think this stuff is just really important. Mm -hmm. and that um, Actually understanding how the tax system works, understanding how we spend money on health and education and um, pensions and so on really matters. And actually part of what we do at the IFS is, um, as well as doing the really you know, hardcore academic research, is we do try mm -hmm. to communicate that more generally. Um, the, the question about a theme is a much is a much harder question to answer, and um, for many reasons I've um, resisted uh, it over over the last you know, years that I've been at the IFS. I've resisted writing a book partly because I never thought I'd have the time, which proved to be absolutely true doing mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, but partly because I thought I don't really have, you know, I don't have a message. And actually, in a sense, the, the, the theme here is that it's all really quite hard. That there isn't a single answer. That there isn't sort of you know if only we could discover. A basic income or taxing the wealthy or um uh, or, or having a flat rate tax system or um you know, reforming the higher education system, everything will be fine there isn't there isn't anything like that in there there's there, there, there is nothing in there which says that there is some there is some answer which goes across all of it i mean what if there is a theme it is it's all really quite hard mm -hmm. and then everywhere you look there are trade-offs 
Um, there are trade-offs in the tax system. You make some people better off, some people worse off if you make it more efficient. There are trade-offs in, in, in health. If you want to spend more there, it costs more somewhere else. There are huge trade-offs in the welfare system. Um, if you give more money at low incomes, then you have to take it away at higher incomes, and that reduces incentives and so on. And I suppose the other, um, the other theme is that I don't think we've got it all right, to put it mildly, that there are uh, there are trade-offs where I think we've got ended up on the wrong end of them, and there are places where we could just make things better without worrying too much about the trade-offs. And in the last chapter, I mean, this isn't actually mostly about economics, that it uses economic um, principles and thoughts and so on as we talk about, as I talk about pensions and, and, and so on. In the last chapter, I make a very strong case that I think we've been on the wrong end of the trade-off between economic growth mm -hmm. and just about everything else, whether you think about you know, planning policy or our relationship with Europe or the amount that we built of houses we build or infrastructure or what have you. There are There is a trade-off here. Yes, you know, no one wants sort of houses built in their back garden or roads built through their front garden or, um, uh, or, or you know, apparently we don't like immigrants coming in from the European Union or whatever. Um, there are trade-offs, um, but in my view, we've been very much on the wrong end of those trade-offs. We've, we've, we, we haven't focused on growth. And one of the consequences is we've had, uh, you know, 15 years of you know, the lowest earnings growth since the Napoleonic Wars. And, um, you know, that's why we feel the current cost of living crisis so badly, because it comes off such a poor uh, a decade and more of growth. So a theme here is, is there are hard, if there's a theme, hard choices, a lot of, you know, things have not been done well, to put it mildly. Um, uh, and But, you know, you see you know, particularly in the world of, you know, social media and so on, you've got so many people saying, just do this. It's easy. Change that. Everything's fine. And, and, and you, if you're looking for easy answers, I'm afraid they're not there. Well, I suspect that's one of the messages that we dismal economists love to spread around. There are some tough choices out there and there are trade-offs. And uh, particularly when it comes to budget policy, you cannot do everything you wish you could do. Uh, so you have to choose. So let me begin there. Um, once upon in my life, I used to write papers about budget institutions and the sort of the infrastructure, political and institutional, of how we go about making policy choices and budget choices and fiscal choices. Um, is Britain in a good place regarding the way we make those choices? Uh, or are we uh, falling into bad practices, populism, short-sightedness, and all those things that other nations have long known? Are we doing things right when it comes to fiscal choices at a general level? I'm going to go into particular issues about tax and uh, and pensions and other things. But uh, is the system working properly? Are we are we making the choices that we should be making? Well, that's a pretty broad question. Yes. I, mean, I mean, to some extent, um, to some extent, we've made some good choices over over recent years. Whether it's been uh, about how we've um, introduced particular policies. Mm -hmm. We can talk about higher education policy and fees. I think there's some quite interesting things happening there. We uh, we can talk about some of the changes to the tax system. But broadly, mm -hmm. I think, as I was saying, we've made a lot of bad choices. So mm -hmm. we look back at last autumn and wow. some of the institutions that you're talking about weren't brought into play. I think we um, it's done quite a lot of damage to the UK. A common, you know, if you, you fire, fire your permanent secretary at the Treasury, mm -hmm. you ignore... Um, the Office of Budget Responsibility, you talk down um, the Bank of England, you you introduce 45 billion of unfunded tax cuts, and then you're surprised when people think this might not be the best idea ever. Um, so, you know, in a sense, you could say things work quite well, because that was that was unwound really quite fast, though um, that wasn't a necessary um, outcome of that. So that was an extreme example of things really not working. Um, if, if you compared with that, most most budgets and so on are you know are pretty okay. But right. um, if you look into the future and what what are the challenges facing us and are we facing up to them, I think is a, is another way of asking that question. And the, the answer has to be no. We're not facing mm -hmm. up to them. We're not facing up to uh, the fact that um, we are we, we've got low growth. We've got an aging population. We've got increasing demands on health and pensions and so on, mm -hmm. and that is driving a higher tax take, not as high as in many Western European countries by any means, but it's a growing one. Um, and we've not had any kind of national conversation about that. We are doing it in a 
um, you know, in my view, a very candid way, massive increases in corporation tax, stealth increases in income taxes by using um, fiscal drag. Um, the Conservative Party and others are very upset about a growing tax burden, but we don't have a discussion about how you might reduce that. I mean, what, what is it in the public sector that you might want to cut out? We've clearly got um, you know, big challenges around climate policy. Um, you know, the biggest fiscal challenge actually is um, we can't even keep the real value of petrol duty up. We haven't increased that in line with inflation for 13 years now. Um, in 20 years time, we'll lose all 30 billion pounds of that revenue. Um, but no one's brave enough to talk about what you're going to uh, what you're going to replace it with. So all of those long term things are, are seriously problematic. And then, I mean, we can talk about the you know the, the separately, I guess, around issues uh, about choices around Brexit and and the evolution to the other nations of the UK. So let's stay with the theme of politics and political economy for for that matter. And two questions for the price of one. I was going to come to the events of last autumn toward the end, but you mentioned it already. So let me get it out on the table. How could it happen? You know, I um, uh, I teach my students that the UK is a country where fiscal institutions work, where consultation takes place, where there's a lot of planning, where the OBR gets consulted beforehand. Uh, somehow, none of this uh, happened the way it was supposed to happen. And of course, markets did not like it. As you pointed out, it was all undone very quickly. So question number one is, how come um, or, or are institutions sufficiently, um, what's, what's, what's a polite way of putting it, flexible so that choices can be made without proper consultation? Uh, could this happen again? Well, it, it's a parliamentary democracy and the prime minister in charge, the party in charge, can essentially do whatever it wants as long as they can <laughs> get it through um, parliament. Uh, and obviously, the OBR and others are only advisory. Um, there's nothing, you know, the OBR cannot say you can't do this. What they would say was, if you do this, this is the fiscal consequences. Now, right. kind of everyone knew what the fiscal consequences would have been anyway. Right. So there's an interesting question as to you know, why it was that the government felt they couldn't even make use of the OBR. They knew what they were going to say. We at the IFS said it anyway. So, uh, but but it wasn't very hard to work out what happens if you. Do 45 billion of tax cuts when the economy is doing badly, when you've got inflation going, uh, when you've got inflation going up, when you've got the uh, the deficit in any case going to be much higher than was projected uh, back in the spring. Um, so, you know, in, in a parliamentary democracy like that, I mean, even if you had the OBR, say, even if you'd use the OBR, it would be perfectly within the purview of the prime minister and chancellor to say, well, we believe something different about the fiscal situation or we're willing to take a bet. And that's what politicians are there for. They can take a bet on, on cutting taxes or raising spending or cutting spending because that's what their, their political instincts are to do. But I think what, you know, what we had um, you know, back in the autumn was this, this combination of um, sacking of the Permanent Secretary of the Treasury just out of pure spite as far as one can um, uh, make out, um, uh, not using the Office of Budget Responsibility um, doing these very, very big tax cuts, um, at, then the Chancellor saying, and there's more to come, yes. and the Prime Minister saying, and we're not going to cut spending, and at the same time, of course, having this huge um, uh, th th this, this huge programme of support for household energy bills, which right. itself um, it was expected at the time to cost of, many tens uh, of billions of pounds, putting lots of pressure on on the buying um, of gilts. Now, um, one thing I think, you know, the were you surprised by the intensity of market reaction? Well, to some extent, because actually there's almost nothing in that mini budget which should have come as a surprise. Right. Uh, because Liz Truss had, you know, if you've been listening, she'd been saying it all over the summer that she was going to do this. Now I have to say, I'd kind of assumed that in the way of most politicians, she was could have kind of rode back on it a bit and uh, not um, cut the corporation tax all the way back and not uh, you know maybe increased employer but not employee national insurance contributions or something i kind of assumed that she wouldn't and maybe the markets kind of assumed that that wasn't going to happen but i but i think it was the combination of everything I, in a sense if she'd only done what she said she was going to do and hadn't done any of what uh, that with the obr and saying that there's more to come and sacking permanent secretaries and so on and done it in a quieter way we don't know the counterfactual, but but maybe maybe the maybe the impact would have been less. It's very it's very it's very hard to know. Uh, but I think one of the you know one of the kind of consequences of this is that I think it's it's going to be another generation 
um, before hopefully politicians think they can just do what they want on the, the fiscal sphere without well, any consequences. I, I have to say that I was surprised too, and that you know you look at the USA and certainly fiscal policy there has been incredibly expansionary and markets seem to love it. Uh, and somehow in the UK, fiscal policy was announced as extremely expansionary and markets did not. Uh, there was a wedge there between the two countries of the North Atlantic, which I at least found, found surprising. Well, the US is a, it was a vastly bigger economy, isn't it? With, yes, uh, but, it's, you know, but it's vastly, I was going to say, worse run. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, at least under the previous administration. I would not say that about, uh, about President Biden. Um, let's let's touch on some of the uh, big topics within the theme of, of of budget making and economic policy. Beginning with pensions, um, here's one very simple way of of, of summarizing uh, your theme. There, if you happen to be receiving pensions now or will retire soon, happen to belong to the generation with a bit of white hair, uh, the system is working very well. But uh, if you will be retiring 15, 20, or 30 years from now, your pensions in real terms will not be uh, uh, as good as what we have today, which I happen to feel, and I'd be curious if you agree with this, it's, it's part of a larger problem, namely industrial democracies seem to pay a lot of attention to the interests of older voters, among other things, because older voters vote more regularly, uh, and not so much to the interests of younger voters who, you know, maybe they don't, don't vote quite as often. And this is not only a matter of tax or, or, or a matter of, of, of pensions. If you think about the way we dealt with, say, the pandemic, um, you know, we were all kept locked up for a very long time when people under 40 could have gone out and worked and, and had probably better time and higher incomes uh, at very, very little risk of themselves, but nonetheless, uh, we thought that was not uh, the right thing to say. So, first of all, is there a bias toward uh, the, the not so young in our system? And secondly, what does this mean for the future of pensions? Yeah, well, the um, the, the sort of the, the, the theme of generational inequality yeah, is certainly yeah, there yeah, yeah. Um, in the book. I should start by saying, though, I start the chapter on pensions to saying that this is one of the, you know, in a sense, what is one of the great triumphs of British social policy over the last fifty years. It has been that we've moved from a world in which um, we were known across the world for how poor our pensioners were. Right. Um, the, the, the levels of pensioner poverty were extraordinary 50 right. years ago. Um, and indeed, uh, a bit more, less than 50 years ago, when I started work in the 1980s, that was still to a large extent the case. And we've now moved to a situation in which that's no longer true. And indeed, poverty, there's less poverty among the pensioner generation than there is among younger generations. So there's a separate right. set of issues right. there. And that reflects a whole series of um, policy change, yeah. partly um, a much more generous safety net, which has um, uh, been introduced particularly over the last 25 years or so. Um, the but, UK is not alone in that. I think increasingly across the world, you see higher poverty rates among the young than among the elderly, precisely absolutely. for these kinds of reasons. Yeah, uh, indeed. Um, but you've also got quite a large... No but the, the extraordinary thing is that once you take account of the cost of housing and the cost of children, yeah. pensioner incomes now are the same on average as non-pensioner incomes are extraordinary. I mean, that's the first time in history uh, where that's been true. And that, of course, means that their income, incomes, not their wealth, their incomes today are higher than their incomes were when they were in, of working age. So they've got more disposable income now, on average, than they had disposable income when they were of working age, which, again, is an astonishing Absolutely. statistic. So you know, wh why have we ended up in that position? Well, it's partly because of um, a set of generous occupational defined benefit pension schemes, which are around a half of pensioners now um, have um, uh, alongside um, the uh, state earnings related scheme, which uh, which many of the rest um, now have uh, have access to. Um, and of course, um, th th this being the generation where about 80 percent of them are owner occupiers and outright um, owner occupiers. Now, you look at the next generation or the generation below that, everything's changed. Um, so these defined benefit pensions essentially no longer exist unless you happen to be lucky enough to work at a university or in the public sector. Um, but for everyone else, it's... Um, you know, it's and universities don't seem to like them very much. We had to, we're in the middle of a strike, as I'm sure you know, precisely over pensions. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's, is it 25% of salary the employer puts in for pension for you? I mean, it's just ludicrously expensive. Um, and the um, and, and, and the, the uh, public sector schemes are also still there and relatively mm -hmm. generous. But in the private sector, it's essentially entirely individual savings pots. Right. Um, uh, so all of the risk is held by the individual, the player in this, alongside employers and the government, at least able to take um, the risk. 
the amounts going in are very small compared to the amounts going into defined benefit schemes. And of course, interest rates are negative in real terms. Um, so the chances of saving your way to a decent pension now are pretty, um, are pretty remote. You've also got a halving in home ownership rates among people in their early 30s over the last 25 um, years or so. And what this is resulting in, of course, is a, is a world in which parental wealth is more important now than it's been for generations um, in uh, determining your wealth, either through gifts or inheritances. And that's, of course, on top of the lack of social mobility. I mean, if you've got well-off parents, you're probably doing well anyway through the education system. So you've got this combination of stagnant earnings, um, growing asset values, partly because of um, monetary policy and fiscal policy, which has favoured an older generation. So you've got this... Um, you, you, you've got this current generation of pensions doing very well, uh, but that will have a combination of effects on future generations. Uh, and I, I worry about the next, you know, the next generation, the generation after that, in terms of you know, not not just their incomes in retirement, but the risks that they're facing um, and the capacity to manage those risks. I mean, there's no annuitization any, anymore, even of these um, of the individual pots. So you're not just facing risk on the way up to retirement; you're facing risk um, afterwards as well. It is, uh, you, you put it in a way that I thought was very interesting. I, I never thought of um, of the fact that I need to, you know, a lot of younger people need to turn to parents for help as making inequality more acute. Because, of course, if you happen to have wealthy parents, you're in good shape. Otherwise, you're not. So there's sort of a second round in the inequality debate exactly. that is that is troubling. Um, we are at a university. So let's talk about education and the financing of education. Of course, we think that higher education is doing very well because we're doing it. Uh, um, but um, but there are many other issues, not the least of which, of course, is the issue of fees, uh, which in this country has been very controversial, to put it mildly. Uh, I was telling Paul as we were coming in that I was in government in my own native Chile a, year, a few years back, and we adopted the UK system of student loans, and it proved just as controversial politically <laughs> there as it, did, as it did here, and it caused people to march on the streets and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, as an economist, I happen to think that it's a system that makes a lot of sense. But there are many other aspects uh, of, uh, of the financing of education. And of course, not education is not all education is higher education. There's also uh, uh, other bits. Where are we? Uh, and uh, and uh, what, are the big, uh, what are the big outstanding issues there? Well, there's plenty, plenty of issues. I mean, one of the um, uh, so, so there's, there's two, two, two chapters in the book on education, one essentially on schools and one on, on what happens after right. school. Um, on, on schools, um, in terms of the financing, um, we are, I think, still not quite spending as much per pupil today as we were back in 2010, right. uh, which is, again, pretty uh, extraordinary. Yeah. And we might, I right. was looking confused, but maybe we are just about spending as much yeah. per pupil as we were back in 2010. Yeah. But that's, that's more than a decade, 13 years with no growth in spending. Um, but remarkably, um, that spending has tipped, if anything, towards um, slightly less, somewhat less deprived schools and away from the more uh, deprived schools. We've clearly got an education system, but actually just a sort of general society in which there's considerable educational uh, inequality and outcomes. That's very hard for government and for the education system by itself um, to fix that, certainly um, any time uh, anytime quickly. Um, we uh, Remarkable changes I think people haven't noticed. There's been a real shift of focus in um, increasing spending on primary schools relative to secondary schools, for example, over a long period of time, which... Um, uh, which is what most experts would recommend, is it not? Uh, to some extent. Yeah. Um, I, I don't... I, it, it, I, I also think there's some real problems with sort of what happens in the, in the sec second half of um, secondary school. So as you move through sort of the education system, um, if there's a if there's a single issue I would pick out for for, for, for the UK or I should say England, mm -hmm. um, it's what happens at sixteen. Yes. Um, that uh, we have these have these exams, these GCSE exams, um, uh, which colleagues of yours here at the LSE have have, have, you know, have looked at the impact of just missing by one point, exactly. not one grade, but one point yeah. missing uh, missing uh, passing those has a huge negative effect on what happens next because we have a very poor set of choices post 16 you either go into these very narrow a levels or a, a huge range of um often not very high quality vocational um uh, qualifications and one consequence of that is at age 15 our, our literacy and numeracy is 
not great, but it's about average. By age 21, it's dreadful. Yes. Um, we have the sort Compared of... Compared to, say, OECD countries. Yeah, but almost the worst in the OECD right. for, right. For, for people in their early 20s. Right. And that, you know, that, that, I think, you can trace through to what happens post... Um, 16. You look at the funding of six forms and further education, that's been cut really dramatically right. over the last um, right. 15 years or so. So that's, you know, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if there's one area where you can see the big you know, reduction in resources, um, that's where it is. But can I stop you there? And uh, is the problem that simply governments are not putting enough money on the table, or is the problem that this sort of two-year uh, six form arrangement, which you would not find elsewhere in the OECD, say, is not well thought out. So is it an institutional design problem or is it a money problem or both? It, it's both. There's certainly an institutional design problem, uh, in, in my view. Um, the as, as, as a parent of a child who just did GCSEs last year and one who'll be doing them next year, yes, I tend to agree. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Uh, it's, yeah. I mean, you, you, you would not find anything like that, say, in Germany or in France yeah. or in the US. Yeah. I mean, you don't tend to have these really sort of yeah. supposedly high um, stakes exams at 16. Precisely. And then this incredible narrowing of the, yeah. of, of the curriculum, curriculum. Yeah, very, at very that on. point. Yeah. Uh, and, but those still, you know, a, a clear route through if you're on that academic route. You do your GCSEs, you do your ALs, you, right. you, you get to university. And the university is, of course, desperate to have you because you come with, you come with money. Um, but if you don't, if you don't do uh, that, it's an incredibly, you know, opaque, complex, muddled, um, often poor quality route going through, right. uh, going through a sort of um, vocational or further right. education right. Right. system. And uh, and you know, one of the gaps we have is we have tiny numbers of people doing vocational qualifications, right. um, which are between the sort of A level standard, the university standard. You look at the cohort of people in their mid twenties. You've got about a third of them who've got a university degree. Um, and you've got a, a bunch who have got um, sorry, 20% or so have got a level three, which is equivalent to a level vocational right. qualification. And you've got next to nobody who's got a qualification between that and uh, a university right. um, a university degree. Um, uh, so higher level apprenticeships and so on are very, I mean, slightly less rare than they were, but they're still very rare. My, uh, I talk about my one of my sons in there who didn't go to university. He did a Higher level apprenticeship in the in the autumn when he started that higher level apprenticeship there were more kids going to Oxbridge than there were starting higher right. high level apprenticeships. I mean that is how sure. um, you know how, how ludicrous our right. system is in right. terms of its lack of that middle that middle right so, range. So we be more like the Germans will presumably get that aspect of higher education very well. I mean very right is that so? I mean you know they really connect companies with apprenticeships and there are many if you choose not to go to uni or if your grades are not good enough to go to uni then there are many things you can do which will guarantee a reasonably high income and usable marketable skills uh, are there models out there that the uk could you know uh, adopt or adapt i think it's hard to take uh, models from other countries which are you know, really based in a you know, long history and another thing that you know, the book again talks about is that uh, you know, a lot of where we've ended up in the tax system a lot of where we've ended up in in the health system and so on, education system, it's very, very historically dependent. I mean, I talk about social care in there. And why does social care look like it does at the moment? Well, you have to go back to the poor laws of the 1600s right, and the beverage right. report of the 1940s to begin to, under, and, and the sort of privatization of the 1980s. All of those things together kind of explain why we are where we are in social care. So it's very historically um, dependent and, and, and the same is true in education. So I don't think we should try and model ourselves on another country, but I think we can identify where we've got problems and we can set about doing things to solve them. And you know, some things that are you know, actually kind of focus on higher quality apprenticeships, right. which we've had over the last few years, is a small step um, in that direction. But I really think a kind of a, a more fundamental look at what happens at age 16, 16 to 18 in the academic and the vocational route is really important. Two more questions from me, and then we will open it up. You just mentioned the two things that I wanted to get to, namely health and tax. So let's begin with health. Uh, you know, the NHS, of course, has been in everybody's discussion and on, on everybody's dinner table for the last three years for obvious reasons. Um, if you listen to, say, Radio 4 every morning, which I do religiously, um, uh, two things get repeated. A, the NHS is in a crisis, and B, the crisis is mostly due to lack of funding. Um, other people would tell you differently that um, it may be, again, an, in, an issue of design, incentives, efficiency, etc. So how good or how bad uh, is the current arrangement and what should we do to, um, to change it? And is it really a matter of money or money alone? 
Well, um, I mean, how bad is the current arrangement? Well, one, one of the things I, I, you know, we have a problem in the UK, which is we sort of treat the NHS differently to anything else. We sort of always worship at its shrine. Indeed. Um, and that is a Protect problem. the NHS. We've heard that once or twice. Exactly. And, and, and that is a problem. Um, and, uh, you know, actually, we have a problem with the with health here in a way that I think, for example, the French have a problem with pensions. I mean, you know, you, you see the strikes going on. Macron would agree with that. Yes. Uh, uh, so it's, you know, different countries have problems in different parts of public policy. And I think we have a problem with the health service, the sort of um, the, the way that we describe it. one of the things I say in there is if you ever hear a politician saying the NHS is wonderful, just compare it with the US, just turn the radio off immediately. Yes. Uh, because yeah, that's like mm. saying the British, you know, the English football team is brilliant because it's better than Monaco. I mean, it's kind of, you know, <laughs> choose the worst example uh -huh. in the world and say you're better than it. It's yeah. not a sensible thing to, it's not a sensible thing to do. If you get someone saying, well, you know, this is how we compare with the Dutch system or the French system, that's kind of interesting. Um, because they are actually much better at keeping people alive than the NHS. And if you just look at the sort of, you look at the bold statistics about the number of people with heart attacks or cancer or whatever who stay alive, we're really not very good. And I think that, that needs to be the starting point um, for some of the conversations. Now, um, I mean, the, the current kind of crisis is you know, a, a series. Clearly, of... you're not going to run for office anytime soon, because if you're running for office, that's not what will get you the votes. No, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm free of that. Uh, I'm free of that concern. And that is one of the, you know, one, one of the problems that, that, that you know, we, we, we have that, um, you know, I'm, I'm free of that concern. But anyone who might actually get elected can't say what I'm saying. Precisely, precisely. Um, but, uh, um, you know, so we, 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 we've got a problem at the moment, which has been building up over um over some time but but appears to be really it, it, there's clearly a, a sort of um a, a money issue here there is a productivity issue in the short term as well um that uh you know we've got more doctors more nurses more but everything let me push you on that point because this is it gets political some people say productivity efficiency some people say money 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 is it 50 50 is it uh 25 75 who which one of the, those two theses is more accurate as a description of the of the problem well, there's a short run problem at the moment. And if you look at the, you know, what, what's happening at the moment is the NHS is doing less with more. Mm -hmm. So compared with 2019, it's got more of everything right. and it's doing less of almost everything. So that, so that, that suggests so, efficiency. So that, that, that suggests there's been, and this, this is a problem across the, I mean, if you look at the short term problem, this is not specific to the UK. Right. Um, this, is, this is true in many countries at the moment. So there seems to be a sort of what looks like a long term impact of COVID. Now, the long-term impact of COVID is not what we all expected it to be. Now, what, what, what did I expect it to be two years ago? Well, something like, I can't remember the numbers, 10 million people missed appointments and right. didn't join waiting lists during COVID right. because the NHS was, you know, was, was, was essentially not accepting customers. So, so we all thought there'd be this wall of people joining waiting lists and arriving at the NHS's door. Hasn't happened at all. Not one more person has joined a waiting list uh, than would have, we would have expected um, ha had that huge backlog not apparently um, built up, which is which is maybe one of the reasons why there are more people turning. Uh, uh, there the, the are worse cases turning up at A and E um, uh, than, than was the case. Mm -hmm. What appears to have happened is that um, actually roughly the same number of people have been joining the waiting list, but fewer people have been getting off at the other end. Now that seems to be associated with there's still some people with COVID in hospital, and that mm -hmm. clearly takes up space and resource and. It's very difficult to deal with. Um, if you talk to people in the NHS, they say that lots of doctors and nurses just aren't capable of being as productive as they were pre-COVID because they're exhausted or they're not being as productive. We've got a problem with getting people out the other end into social care, uh, which appears to be um, part of the issue, and a very com complex system in which you know, small problems in one part of the system can create really big problems um, in another part of the system. So there's a sort of system-wide issue there. Um, there is a um, you know, over long periods. There's a um, in terms of our health. There is a, there is a cash issue, which is partly you know, what is one of the costs of our economy growing so slowly over the last thirteen years. Uh, well, we spend roughly an average amount of our national income on health, but our national income is less than it otherwise would have been. So there's 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 less money going in, and we also over the 2010s, really, really didn't invest in the capital infrastructure, mm -hmm. not just building hospitals, but by buying MRI machines and, uh, and, and, and keeping, right. keeping, right. Things, uh, keeping things going. So we kept moving money into keeping things going in the short run, which has uh, meant that it's much harder to keep them going in the long run because you don't have the capital. Well, we could stay on health forever, but we do want to turn to the Q&A in a minute. But 
I must ask about taxes before we do. Uh, I've got the book open to the page on tax system. Um, and um, it's quite remarkable. I will not quote the whole thing, but let me just tell you that I'm referring to the UK tax system. Uh, the adjectives are ludicrous, insane, <laughs> uh, unnecessarily complex, bizarre. Uh, um, and it goes on uh, like that for a while. Uh, and of course, if you're going to buy a, a house, the uh, system for taxing housing is expensive and a costly disaster. Um, clearly, you're not too keen on current arrangements uh, uh, on tax. What do we do about it? First of all, what, what it, why is it so wrong and so bizarre and so ludicrous? And number two, uh, how do we fix it? I think I may have been selectively quoted there. Uh, um, but I'm sure they, they, uh, those, 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 were, those words definitely. Each one is, of those appears. Page, sure. 76. Uh, um. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, I mean, the, 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 I mean, in some ways, the, the tax uh, chapters are sort of, you know, uh, almost the best reads of the book, I think, because yeah. there's, so, there's so much to sort of laugh at in the tax system that um, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, um, you uh, as I point out, that if you want a if you want a pet, buy a rabbit because there's no VAT on rabbits because rabbits are edible. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, which is um, you know one of the more interesting facets of the um, facets of the tax system. Some some countries do eat dogs. <laughs> <laughs> not, not here, I suppose. <laughs> not 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 here. Uh, but 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 also there, there there's facts on bumblebees, but not on honeybees. Um, for similar <laughs> sorts of um, similar sorts of reasons, um, uh, so so yeah, but there, there, there's lots of fun to be had with the with with with, with the tax system. I mean, all, all sorts of absurdities uh, about it. I mean, the um, you know the way we I mean, looking at the big the big stuff, um, the way that we um, charge uh, um, uh, national insurance on um, you know, people of working age, but not people of pension age. It's just a tax. It bears no relationship to anything. It's just a tax. Uh, but national insurance rates have gone up, whilst income tax rates have gone down, part of the generational thing that you right. referred to. Um, our rates of tax on capital gains are way below rates of tax on, on income, which means that private equity people pay a lot less tax on their income than the normal, um, the normal people. Uh, that um, you know, uh, we have a, a, a excessively generous non-dom regime uh, at the top, uh, for example. Um, inheritance tax, if you're healthy, wealthy and well-advised, um, it, it, it's, it's an absolute doddle to avoid it. If um, if all you've got is a house and a pension, you basically can't avoid it, which is right. one of the reasons right. why uh, the sort of average rate of inheritance tax halves between um, I think two billion and ten million in terms of uh, sort of um, uh, assets that you uh, that, that you have. We've got the narrowest VAT Europe, VAT base I think in the world. Um, certainly one of the narrowest VAT bases um, in the world. You're referring to the taxation of housing where. We charge people enormous amounts to move house um, through stamp duty, which makes absolutely no sense. Which is, uh, you know, which is incredibly um, uh, in yeah. inefficient. Means that uh, you know, people can't move to the. Uh, well, people are locked into their properties. Exactly. Exactly. They're also more locked in. Part uh, smaller issue, but council tax because it's regressive in the value of the property and um, quite low compared to the taxation of housing elsewhere in the rich world. Yeah. Um, uh, which which means that the uh, is the, I can't again I can't quite remember but the the average council the council tax as a proportion of value in Hartlepool is something like fifty times bigger than the uh, council tax as a proportion of value in Westminster. Yeah. I, I, don't quote me on that because I've probably got those numbers wrong, but you, yeah. you get the idea. That, that sounds um, right. That there's, there's a huge huge yeah. gap that uh, you know if you're in a low if you're in a, in, in a low value property in Hartlepool you have a vastly higher tax rate as a proportion of the value of your property than if you're on a high value property um, in, in Westminster. Sure. So but in all of those things together, I mean, again, they are they are sol soluble um, uh, sort of techni technically, but politically, um, you know, both parties of um, you know, Labour could have done something through in this in the 2000s. They had big reviews of it. They decided to do nothing. Um, and, and uh, Conservatives uh, more more recently. The one good thing in Kwasi Kwarteng's mini budget was that he reduced stamp duty, but that was undone alongside everything else in the right. in, in the next uh, in the next okay. fiscal event. So, last bit before we move on to the to the audience, just uh, as a riff on the last thing you said, not not the mini budget, but right before. So, it sounds as though the UK is making the wrong choices along many of these dimensions. In a democracy, you know, politics is the way we make these choices. 
So is this ultimately a political problem? Um, well, it is. I mean, it's uh, and it's a difficult political problem because some of the, you know, a lot of the things we talk, talked about will be difficult, uh, politically difficult to make changes to. But it's one of the reasons for writing the book was you know, if everyone read this, then they'd obviously understand and um, you know <laughs> and vote for the right stuff, uh, whatever that may, if if it were on offer. Right. Um, but the so but but there are yeah I mean I mean some of the things. You know, Politicians kind of know that the council tax system is broken, but yeah. they're not going to make changes to it. Because well, you, you, you have spoken like an academic because you and I maybe presume that uh, knowledge will make us free. But of course, there's something called a pocketbook and interests and uh, other things that are not all about knowledge, which are about, you know, I will fight for my uh, pecuniary interests and you'll fight for yours. And in the end, we'll have it out somehow. Uh, and often the outcome of that fight will not be particularly efficient or pretty. And the other aspect of politics I, I talk about in, in various parts of this book is, is, is to turn over in ministers. Now, obviously, last year was absurd. Yeah. But if you just look, yeah. even ignoring last year, yeah. um, the number I, I worked in the education department back in, in the early 2000s. And again, I can't quite remember. I think there have been 13 secretaries of state for education in the last oh, 20 years, nice. something something ludicrous um, uh, like that. And in the last seven years, we've had goodness knows how many sections of state for work and pensions yeah. and so on and so on. So it's very hard and, to get and, consistent policy. And even chancellors recently. Policy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, chancellors, we used to used to keep for quite a long oh, time, gosh, but they, um, yeah. you know, they, we, we, we seem to have become careless with our chancellors more recently. When, when I tell my friends in Latin America that the UK had five chancellors in two years, they go, oh, that can't, can't possibly be right. <laughs> uh, um, in any case, uh, this has been fascinating. I could keep asking questions, but uh, I will I will exercise some self-discipline and open it up to the um, to our audience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours. Yes, sir, right here in front. We have a microphone. We don't have a lot of time, so we could keep if our questions brief. We're able to assess the cost of centralization and the possible impact if local authorities were able to raise more of their uh, expenditure locally um so certainly there's a chapter in there on uh, local government and devolution um uh, i don't think i can put a cost on centralization but england is certainly a very centralized country relative to most other countries and again sort of weird history here that um you know, gradually things that local authorities have done in the past have been taken away from them the most recent effectively was a lot of the control over schools um budgetary and in in, in terms of policy uh, which was sort of done almost be almost below the radar, but um, in initially under the last Labour government, partly in response to sort of a few bad headlines one year, um, uh, movement of um, you know, really almost constitutional change in terms of responsibility for some local services. And we're, we're, we're now in a world where more, much more than half of what local government does is social care, children's and adult social, social care, um, it, bit, bits of the state, welfare state that are kind of particularly... Um, unloved um now uh and we've also got this extraordinary situation where the way in which we provide money to local authorities is is, is based on data which is massively out of date so it's almost random what we give local authorities now in terms of um in terms of the equalization um between them now could can you do a lot more in terms of um getting local areas raising their own money it's really hard because obviously if you gave if you gave that power to Westminster, they could raise a pile you extremely easily and you gave it to Hartlepool, there's no money there to raise. So you then sort of have to do an awful lot of equalization if you don't want to kind of um, result in very, very big differentials between different parts of the country. So I mean there are ways, I mean, there are ways you can do that where essentially you, you end up giving more money um to uh to local authorities. But I do I, 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 my sense, my instinct, my instinct is that more devolution at a regional uh, level or at a, a large, uh, a reasonably large local level, my instinct is the more devolution of powers there would be you know, valuable socially and economically um, in the long run. I can't prove that, but that is my that is my that is my instinct on the basis of having read and, and listened to a lot of work in this area. Let's see. Uh, in the third or fourth boat there, in the blue jumper. Yes. There we go. Yes. Actually, not a jumper. In the, in the tie. Sorry, I, I could not. It was yes, right there. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Um. Do you think private schools should have their charitable status removed? Um. 
That's not 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 something that uh, uh, discussed specifically there. I mean, one thing that um, what is striking is that um, the gap in funding between private and state schools has doubled over the last um, thirteen years or so, as um, the, the per pupil spending on state schools has been flat, and private school fees have risen really quite fast over that um, over that period. Now, private schools. Um, you know, educate what is it seven or eight percent of the population um two-thirds of high court judges way more than half of ministers 60 percent of um uh, of uh of um uh, let's see um leaders and so on come from uh from from this this group so they they, they have a very important role of, of, of the cohort that answers university every year what share is private school educated uh don't know um but um, significantly above their um, share in the right. their share in the population probably, what a third um, or something like that so it's, you know, it's probably it's probably four, something yeah. uh, along those lines and a very high fraction of post british postgraduates so i can't something like a quarter of everyone who goes to private school does pr postgraduate degree it gets right. a much smaller fraction of right. people who go to um state schools now um i i find it as i say, i don't address this in the book i find it quite hard to see why uh, private schools have charitable status. They're clearly, um, you know, they, they, you know, they are fee-paying organisations which are there largely for the benefit of the people paying the fees, which is not um, not how I would usually define um, charity. But there surely is a positive externality. We like to reward those things, don't we? Well, uh, is there a positive externality? I mean, there is, um, you know, our... The, the other extraordinary fact is two thirds of our Nobel Prize winners were privately educated. So these are probably quite good at educating people right. as well as everything else. So there might be a positive externality in that sense. Uh, you could also argue there's a negative externality in terms of the sort of um, social immobility and inequality that's created as a result. But I think that's an interesting issue around you know, an education system needs to be really good at educating you know, the most able, and that creates inequality. Um, uh, but um, you know, an education system which which reserves something a bit of it to the those who are most able to pay creates that different sort of inequality. I wouldn't call that a positive externality. Right, right. Actually, this is not the subject of tonight. But one striking difference between leading schools in the U.S. and the U.K. is you know the, the U.S. also has some very expensive, very good private schools. They all have extensive bursaries and make an effort to incorporate. Uh, low-income kids, which is much less common in the in the UK than it is in the US. That's a big, big difference. Uh, but in any case, that's not the subject of tonight. Um, I will confess that I'm not wearing my glasses, and beyond row three, I cannot see very much. Uh, uh, so you, yeah, you may you may have to uh, sort yourselves into. Uh, I see a gentleman right there uh, in the blue, and then we'll move on to the back. Yes. Uh, can we get a microphone over there, please? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, two brief questions. Um, post Brexit, the money going to the agricultural lobby, will it go into farming or will it go into environmental schemes? Because farmers are very worried. And second, uh, our national security, defence. Right. Um, so the, 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 the book largely covers the welfare state, so it doesn't um, uh, cover those two um, issues. I mean, on, on defence, um, uh, the I mean, the, the most important thing about defence is that spending on defence has been on a long term decline wow. from um, something like a maximum, I think, 10 percent of national income during the Korean War in the early 50s down to 2 percent of national income now. And essentially, that's how we funded the welfare state. So we've, we've essentially abolished defence spending and spent it on pensions and the NHS um, and education and working age welfare. That's essentially you know, absurd oversimplification, of course, but that's broadly how until recently, we have managed to have a growing welfare state with a tax burden, which has actually been pretty steady um, until about now. Now, there's no more defence spending to get rid of. It's at 2% of national income, which is the minimum NATO requirement. Right. Uh, and you know, given what's happened in Ukraine and elsewhere, it's not going to go, in my view, down below 2% and may... Could it go know, up? It, well, it, it, I, th I think the Prime Minister promised last summer that he'd take it to 2.5% of national income. Certainly, Liz Truss promised to take 3% of national income. I'm not sure that will happen, mm -hmm. but you can see where the pressures um, are. Uh, so you've got that that, that set of pressures um, uh, on, on defence spending. So nothing to get rid of there. You've got, as I say, low, low growth 
increasing pressures on health and so on. And that's why very suddenly the tax burden is rising from, it's been around 33 or 34% of national income for decades, and it's going to 37% of national income over about three or four years. Um, now, that's not just because of defence, that's because you know we, we, we've been through a decade of very, very tight spending limits and, and, and the, 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 there's more required there, very low growth, very high spending on debt interest over this period. All of that is resulting in that increase in um, in, in, in the tax burden. I'm afraid that I'm, I'm, I, 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 I think the only thing I say here about agriculture is, um, is, is, the, is the extent to which it is extraordinarily tax tax privilege. So um, in ter- for inheritance tax and, mm. uh, and, and, and business rates where um, that's just, just one of the many areas where- I suppose um, that is one legacy of um, the EU, right? The US very, very farm friendly. Yeah, well, the tax policies are not anything to do with the EU. Um, that, those, those, those are things that have been our own, um, okay. our own invention. Fair, fair, point, long fair point, yes, yes. Expenditure in the EU is very farm friendly. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Um, the woman in um, in the blue right there by the, uh, yes, right there. Uh, there's a microphone coming away. Yes. Hello. Is there an answer to the question as to whether it is better, you, whether you get more of a tax take if you have a flat rate band and no graded bands um, in terms of no exception, say you had a 25% tax rate, everybody across the board, do you get a bigger tax take than the kind of forest of bans and all sorts of exceptions and the whole industry of avoidance that you then comes with that? Mm-hmm. And has any country tried it? Well, there's a lot in that question because there's um, there's the issue of the progressivity of the of the rate structure. So we you know, how do we have a progressive system where we have a twelve and a half thousand pound allowance and then we have a um, a 20p rate and then a 40 and then 45. Um, now, within it, it, because of it, partly because of that structure, though uh, also very much because of the inequality in the income distribution, the top one percent of income taxpayers pay 30 percent of income tax. Um, that's partly because they've just got an awful lot of money, and the top 0.1 percent pay I can't remember 10 percent or something. So, so very, very concentrated payment of tax. Now, that is certainly substantially to do with the fact they're paying 45% and not 25% tax on the very large majority um, of their income. Um, But the other part of your question is around allowances and so on. I think there's a bit of a myth that economists think always that low rates and wide bases are a good thing. Sometimes there's a good reason for having allowances. Actually, in my view, there's a good reason of having allowances for pension saving. I mean, you, you ought to be paying tax once on your income, not twice, um, for example. In the corporate tax system, there's a good case for allowances for investment rather than um, having, a, having a very broad um, base weight and, and, and a lower rate. Um, so whilst you know, well, there's a lot of problems with our tax system, and there are certainly a lot of differences between capital gains tax and income tax and income tax and national insurance contributions, which create um, all sorts of um, opportunities for avoidance, and there are some um, sort of you know, specialised allowances which also provide opportunities for avoidance. I think, on the whole, I would not think that uh, moving to the sort of system that you're describing would uh, would be better than than we've got at the moment. We need a sort of slightly, mm. as ever, I'm afraid in this book, um, it's uh, it's slightly more nuanced and difficult rather than um, a straightforward answer like that. Sorry, countries have tried that. The Baltics have. Uh, and other countries, a number of post-communist countries have, and obviously it has some some pros and, and some cons, and some people who love it, and some people who dislike it very heavily. Would it be true, going back to, to, to the issue of allowances, I am under the impression, but I stand to be corrected, uh, that uh, you begin to pay income tax in the UK at a fairly low level of threshold, given the whole income distribution, but more people pay income tax in the UK than in most other developed economies. Well, the um, uh, about forty percent of adults don't pay income tax in the UK, so it's a remarkably high number. About forty percent, perhaps a little bit more than forty percent, don't pay income tax, which means that they've got taxable income of less than twelve and a half thousand pounds. Now, that's but, an but extraordinary. That, but that includes a lot of people who don't work at all, right? Yeah, so that that's right, all adults. Right, so that, right. that that includes students and right. pensioners. But, but for the working and, population, the share that um, does pay, uh, I think is it's 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 fairly high. But I mean, it's it's it's, it's a really important 
thing to, I mean, yeah. again i think the book is full of these sort of things which i think are really important to get context but scale here yeah. right. so right. so i think most people don't re- certainly most people working age don't realize that 40 percent of, of adults don't pay um don't pay income tax now the extraordinary thing about our you know policy on tax allowances is that we spent you know, um the, the 2010s increasing and spending billions tens of billions on increasing the point at which you start to pay income tax mm-hmm. and now we're bring, very quickly bringing it down again right. as that's proved to be too um as that's proved to be too expensive and using fiscal drag i think it's something like 30 billion is going to be raised a year um uh, by 2026 because simply by freezing that personal right. Right. Uh, that personal allowance so right. just one of the examples of a complete lack of long-term strategy is supposedly the same government over this um period of time but part of the you know but part of the issue here was a, a failure really to look forward in the 2010s to what was obvious to everyone which is you know the, the pressures on the state are only going to rise it's going to be really hard to keep the tax burden at its level let alone increase it and yet and yet a lot of a lot of spending and political effort was put into cutting uh, taxes oh. Well, context is important. On page one, you learn that the UK spent in 2022-23 20, 1.8 trillion pounds. Yeah, it's very exciting. We went over the yeah. trillion pound mark. Exactly. That's a big number, right? Um, we, um, over there, please. Yes. Um, and then in the back, the lady in the green. Uh, or maybe since the microphone is right there, we'll start with you and then move, move down this way. Yes. Hi. Um, you suggest a lot of really interesting changes, like you know, equalising the regime between self-employed and the uh, and everyone else, and you know, VAT, like stopping all the exemptions. If we're imagining we've got a Labour government just waiting in the wings, wanting to cut, they're about to come in, and someone's read your book, and they can like expend some of their political, they can like credit on something. What's the thing that you think would make the biggest difference, like the reform that you'd most like to see a politician spend their political credit on in the tax system yeah. in the tax system or generally how have you choose to interpret the question goodness me um imagine imagine we've got Keir Starmer sitting there in the a, in a second row what's the message he, he should take away when it comes to tax well the um there's a lot in there but if, if I had to pick one thing that really annoys me about the tax system we discussed this briefly earlier it is stamp duty right. um and and council tax yeah. uh so um increasing council tax particularly on expensive properties and yeah. and significantly reducing um stamp duty would certainly be very high up my list of things to do um on the tax side who opposes that why why is it a political equilibrium as our colleagues in political science would say well it's um stamp duty is it brings in 12 billion a year or something like that really quite easily from the government's point of view and i think if you're sitting in treasury or hmrc and you're getting this 12 billion a year no right no one's really complaining about it. no right right right, um, right but i'm not saying you you abolish that and do nothing else i'm saying you you, you lower that no. increase the other one and come out ahead right I mean, um, it's because tax. I mean, I mean, the truth is that um, taxes, when paying a tax when you're receiving income or buying something, right. um, uh, tends to be less unpopular than paying tax out of your bank account, as you do with um, as you do with council tax. Yeah, but, or, but every major industrial country has property taxes that are substantially higher than council tax in this country, right? Uh, and yeah. and and usually they don't have a stamp tax, which is very small. So everybody else has done it. It could be yeah. so difficult. Well, it you know it, it ought to be possible. It's also you you, you ought to be able to have a sort of um, uh, coalition of. I mean, there are um, red wall conservatives who are very much in favour of council tax right. reform because actually who, who gets hit? most by the current system is as i say it's people in low value houses in the north of england um and they they, and and so that i mean it's it's a no-brainer it seems to me from an efficiency and an equity point of view but again who who will be hit by who will be hit by this well quite often older people in 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 relatively um, valuable houses in um in surrey and they kind of vote you know for the government right exactly absolutely um there was another woman right there with her hand up right um well we're in yes please Hi, um, I was wondering if you could just speak, obviously a big topic, but maybe a bit quickly about the pressures that the green transition is going to pose on spending. Um, how screwed are we? Uh, <laughs> um, and have we actually made any plans to kind of 
alter our financial system to kind of cope with this? My assumption is no, but I'd love to hear some positive <laughs> outcomes. So, so How that, screwed are we? Uh, well, in general. Right. <laughs> um, so there is the, the, the sort of the, um, about half of my final chapter is devoted to um, green transition and, and, and the challenges fa- uh, that, that climate change poses. Um, I'll start off with some positive. I mean, actually, um, we've done pretty well so far, I think. Um, we've gone a long way to decarbonizing the electricity uh, system, um, largely without people noticing, um, really, as, because the same stuff comes out the plug as ever, uh, is part, partly the reason. Um, and until now, until recently, um, you know, the cost has well, the, the cost has been on consumer bills, but partly because um, uh, partly because a lot of appliances have become more efficient over that period. Um, that's not had a big effect on the amount that people actually pay. We kind of know how to do this now. Um, there's lots more to do in terms of getting the grid uh, ready. We need to be able to store electricity um, uh, better. Um, and we need to get rid of these absurd planning restrictions on on on, on wind farms um, on land. Um, but there's a long way to go, partly because just even on the electricity generation side, um, not least because we're going to need an awful lot more electricity if we're going to be running all of our cars um, on it and if we're going to be using it for heating. Um, so despite the fact we've done a really good job so far on decarbonizing the electricity that we've got, and there's still... I can't remember the numbers again, but there's a lot more um, to do on that front. We also seem to be making you know, surprisingly good progress in a way on electric cars. I mean, I think if two years ago, I'd have been less, much less positive than I am now about, uh, about how that change is happening. Um, you know, uh, so we, we ought to be in a world where we really can phase out new sales of new petrol and diesel cars from 2030, which I think is currently uh, policy. Now, it's going to take a long period after that before they're all off the road, and we may have hiccups, may have big hiccups um, along the way. The thing that really worries me, um, so, so there, there's also lots of things to do with in this industry and agriculture, uh, but the thing that really, you know, I don't think we've got, we know what we're going to do is decarbonizing heating of houses so you know we, we've all probably everyone in this room's got a you know, gas boiler right. um uh how are we how are we going to replace that is that going to be hydrogen is that going to be heat pumps with electricity is it going to be pure electric we don't know um and that's going to be a huge and very expensive um challenge um going uh, going forward and that's uh um you know if you look at the the climate change committee um, I think thinks that over the next 30, 30 years, we need something like one and a half trillion of investment. Um, their view is that, uh, you know, in a, in, in a worst case scenario, half a trillion of that will need to come from the public sector. Those are, those, those are big numbers, but they're not impossible numbers in the, in the scale of things. But they do require things to be done you know, efficiently, well managed, well planned and so on. And Whilst we've got this, you know, target of net zero by 2050, we're a long way from having clear plans um, for getting there. That's big money. Not impossible, but substantial. We are over time, but I'm, uh, if Paul is okay with this, maybe we'll take one more question. Um, at this point, I am failing to see anybody behind row five, but uh, gentleman right there, who was the first person who actually uh, raised his hand at the very beginning. Yes, sir. You 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 get the microphone and the last word. Thank you very much, and thank you, Paul, for writing a book which is so accessible and covers such a waterfront of public policy. Um, can I take us back to tax and welfare? Um, so uh, you started talking a bit about the last autumn and uh, the Prime Minister's mini budget, uh, and she seems to be on manoeuvres saying that uh, the economic establishment hasn't understood the effect of tax on GDP. So I thought I'd ask uh, 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 the preeminent director of the IFS. What's your take on the effect of tax cuts, income tax cuts and other such on GDP and on tax revenue? And related to that, the effect of working age welfare incentives on GDP and on whether they pay for themselves? Um, Well, I mean, there's lots of different taxes which have lots of different effects. I mean, I am nervous about corporation tax going up to 25%. And uh, given that we have a very broad corporation tax base, that will take us to 
one of the highest corporation tax takes in the OECD. Now, that's a very big change from where we've been. Now, corporation tax isn't everything. Lots of other things matter. Um, but uh, I'm a little bit nervous about that. Um, would I be nervous about putting 2p on the basic rate of income tax? No, not even slightly. Um, would I be uh, nervous about um, putting 2p on all rates of income tax and doing more on capital gains tax? No, I wouldn't be terribly um, uh, I wouldn't be terribly nervous. Well, why is 25% corporate so high? The, the, the US at 30 for many years. Yeah, but the, the rate is high, but the base, the rate isn't terribly high, but the base is much broader than in other countries. Right. Um, so the. But again, the amount of. Presumably like that. Well, no, not necessarily. I, you um, said so already, uh, no, but in this no, case, I'm not so, sure exactly so, why. Well, so, so you, with, with the corporation tax, you really do want. Um, ideally, uh, any investment fully written off against corporation tax, you want uh, mm -hmm. uh, both interest um, uh, funded by both interest and by, by debt and by equity mm -hmm. ought to be um, uh, written off against corporation tax. And it's not. Uh, and that is actually quite a significant disincentive to um, investment. So I, I prefer a higher rate right. and, a, and, and a less broad base, certainly for UK. So by base, you don't mean the number of people paying it, you mean the absence of, of credits? I, I mean the, 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 the sort of the, the measure of profit on which the corporate the corporate okay. tax rate applies. Okay. So, right. so we've, um, uh, you know, so a lot of European countries have apparently very have much higher rates of corporation tax and have much lower takes because yes. they've got less broad base. Right. In terms of growth, actually, I mean, one thing I also say in here, which I think is, is, is really important, and economists talk about far too little, is actually the importance of stable institutions and politics. Um, this really matters for growth. And whatever you think of Brexit, um, which you know, in my view clear, clearly had a negative effect on growth in itself, the political convulsions that we've had over the last seven years, in my view, have also had a negative effect um, on growth. Um, when, when, you, when you've got such uncertainty about the direction of policy when you've got such uncertainty about the views of politicians on on the institutions when you when you have the sort of chaos we had last autumn well that is bad for growth because that you know that people aren't going to want to invest uh, and that's probably more important and we're certainly more important than the details um uh, of uh, of the tax system um very briefly um on on welfare we've actually been pretty good uh, get it, uh, designing a welfare system over the last 20 years, which has pushed quite a lot of people into work. But we've been really bad at designing a welfare system that gets them into good work with good pay. So if you look at lone parents, for example, welfare system changes have had a really big effect increasing the numbers of lone parents in work. Uh, to a first approximation, all of those people have been into part-time low-paid work. Um, the savings to the state have been tiny, uh, because um, there's still quite a lot of support in work and actually some of the changes that push people into uh, incapacity benefits uh, and so on. And the long-term benefits to people being in this long, this, this um, low-paid um, part-time work is very small in terms of their capacity to move on through the labour market. So we need to think really hard about not just, as we have traditionally, designing a system that gets people into work, but also designing a system which helps them progress once they're in. One last question, I'm afraid we'll have to call it a day. At the, at the outset, you said that we, the UK had made the wrong choices and perhaps we were not fo focusing enough on growth. Give us the one thing that the UK could do, one, not three, to stimulate growth. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give you one or three. I'm going to give you seven. I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> Look, so, how, how about two point five? <laughs> <laughs> get, get closer to the single market. Sort out planning. Um, improve uh, the tax system. Invest in um, appropriate infrastructure, and possibly most important of all, um, get the education system right. Okay, that's only five. Pretty good summary. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause.